Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Charity Village webinar. We will wait just a moment for everyone to join the session. Okay, we will get started. Welcome to today's Charity Village webinar. My name is Charlie and I'm the graphic designer and marketing coordinator here with Charity Village. As we are gathering here on a virtual platform, it is important to acknowledge that each of us is joining this webinar from the ancestral or unceded lands of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation people. As a settler on this land, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. For those who may be joining a Charity Village webinar for the first time, Charity Village is Canada's largest online job board for the nonprofit sector. In addition to our online job board, organizations can also post volunteer positions. So if you're looking for work or to recruit talent in the sector, Charity Village is a great place to start. We also have a ton of excellent resources for nonprofit professionals, including online courses, articles, fundraising tools, and free webinars like the one we are presenting today. Before we start today's webinar, I would like to, I would like to quickly run through some housekeeping items. You may have noticed that when you joined the webinar, you were automatically placed on mute. Since we have hundreds of participants in today's session, it is important for us to minimize the amount of background noise so that everyone can clearly hear the presentation. But you can still ask questions and make comments using the question box at the bottom of the Zoom control panel. So look for that at the bottom of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please submit your questions as you think of them, and we will do our best to get to as many as possible. You can also email your questions to webinars at charityvillage.com. If you happen to encounter any technical issues with the webinar, whether with viewing the presentation or with the audio, please let us know in the question box or by sending us an email. We will do our best to get any technical difficulties resolved as quickly as possible. But in a worst case scenario, please remember that we are recording today's webinar and we will send you the full recording by email tomorrow. So if you get called away or disconnected, you'll still be able to view the full presentation. And with that, I would like to welcome our presenter for today, Nick Gillardi. Nonprofit Governance Consultant at Rise and Run. Rise and Run, sorry. <laughs> Welcome, Nick. Hi, thanks, Charlie. And hi to everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm really happy to be here um, to chat with you about what is one of my favorite uh, things to talk about, nonprofit governance. I've been doing governance work for about 18 years now, and I have seen the same sort of challenges pop up over and over again in our sector. The same sort of tired uh, best practices and conventional advice um, being applied over and over again without any real change or results for organizations. And I think that most people in the sector uh, would acknowledge that by and large, the way we're doing nonprofit governance just isn't working very well for many organizations. Board members tend to feel undervalued and disengaged. EDs are overwhelmed and uh, many organizations just don't have the level of strategic leadership that they really want or need. And there are a number of reasons why nonprofit governance has been um, such a pain point for so many organizations. It, it is a complex area and for some people it can be intimidating or confusing. It requires a lot of investment in um, process development, which many organizations just don't have the capacity to manage. And it's an area where there's a lot of people involved, right? We've got personalities and backgrounds and experiences and a lot of power dynamics, which means that there's always going to be some tension in governance spaces. But tension is not the same as pain. Uh, so governance shouldn't be painful. And we don't have to accept the sort of crappy status quo that we've been living with for a while. Um, having said that, there's no easy fix when it comes to nonprofit governance. But I do think that there are a few things we can do to demystify and simplify governance. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. The first thing we'll look at is sort of the big picture of nonprofit governance. And I wanna shift the conventional perspective around what governance is, why we do it, and where it's happening in your organization. And then we'll talk about where boards fit into that big picture. And we'll get very specific about how to build a functional and sustainable board for your organization. So I want to start just by checking in with folks um, and grounding this conversation in the reality of what you're experiencing in the organization or in the sector. 
So take a moment to respond to the poll. And what I want to know is, what is your biggest governance concern right now? Is it lack of strategic leadership, challenges, recruiting and retaining? Um, is it not enough capacity to support your board? Are you having trouble engaging board members effectively or is it something else? And if you choose something else, I want you to um, drop something in the Q&A to tell us what that is. So we'll give folks a moment to, um, to complete the poll and we'll see what we've got here. Okay, so what is your single biggest governance concern right now? 42% um, um, of people are saying engaging board members effectively. That does not surprise me at all. That is the number one concern I hear from folks when I'm um, doing governance work. I will say, it's something that I hear from executive directors a lot, sometimes from board chairs. Um, when, I, when I talk to people who actually sit on boards, they're not asking to be engaged. They're saying, what am I supposed to do? Um, so I think that's an interesting, um, a bit of a difference in perspective around board engagement, but we will talk about board engagement today. Uh, let's see, next at 23%, we have lack of strategic leadership for boards. Um, that's another really common experience uh, for organizations. Boards often struggle to make big picture strategic decisions, and we'll talk about that as well. Challenges recruiting and retaining board members is coming in at 21%. And I think this is something that we will see growing in the sector. Uh, most folks here have probably seen the data around volunteerism in Canada. The trends are, um, are pointing downward. Um, and so I think it's going to become harder and harder to get people to do board work. Um, at the same time, I think board work is getting more and more complex. And so it's uh, less and less attractive for people. And then let's see, we have 9% uh, struggling with capacity for supporting boards and 6% um, looking at something else. And you'll see what those um, concerns are in the Q&A. Okay. So the conventional uh, or most common model that we see for nonprofits right now, and for the last 20 years, certainly as long as I've been doing this work, uh, maybe longer, is what I call the board-centric model. So if we think about nonprofit governance as a system, the board-centric model assumes that the entire governance system orbits the board. The board is like the sun that holds everything together. In this approach, governance is about the board and everything else is secondary, including the organization's core purpose, okay? And anything that happens has to go through the board or be of the board or involve the board or consult the board, right? The board becomes a, a big bottleneck. When governance is about the board, you end up in this sort of funny place where it becomes really challenging to solve any kind of governance pain point because you're stuck with this circular reasoning where the board exists for governance and governance exists for the board, right? This leads to like this very abstract procedural kind of checklist based approach to governance. And this is where people start to feel sort of confused about governance and why a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their heads around nonprofit governance. We think it's something that we don't understand because we don't know how to define it in a way that's accessible and helpful to people. The board-centric model, this is the paradigm we live in right now. And most people who sit on boards are truly not sure why they're there. Even if they have a high level of governance literacy, many board members really struggle to understand like, what am I doing here? Why does it matter that I am here? What is the point? And really the answer that we've uh, like we keep giving people is, you know, because governance, which is not a very helpful or satisfying explanation. So what I'm proposing is a shift in how we think about governance, where we put your governance's uh, or your organization's core purpose at the heart of governance. And the board is just one part of the overall governance system that orbits core purpose. So I'll get into the implications of this shift in a moment, but I do wanna point out why it's so helpful to think about governance in this way, because it moves us 
out of that circular reasoning where governance exists for the sake of governance. And we can actually start to understand the true role of governance, which is to advance your organization's core purpose. So, I mean, every organization has a core purpose and governance is your navigation system. It's about keeping your organization moving in the direction of your core purpose. And when we look at it this way, suddenly governance and board issues become a lot easier to solve because you have like a fixed point on the horizon that you can work towards that's outside of the board. And this is a much more intuitive and grounded way to engage in governance when we look at it from this perspective of advancing core purpose. Okay, so let's look at some of the implications of thinking about governance from the lens of core purpose. And we start with that why piece. We can all very quickly have a shared understanding of why governance matters because it's about advancing core purpose, right? And that's why, that's why people are in your organization. That's why people come to your board. So it's a really great way to focus and rally um, everyone in your governance system. The implication here, though, is that if your organization does not have a strong, clearly articulated sense of core purpose, and, and truthfully, many, many organizations do not, many organizations are not clear on what their core purpose is, and, and those organizations will struggle with governance. It will feel aimless. It will feel pointless. So sometimes governance pains are really about unclear organization purpose. And clarifying core purpose is the first step to designing any governance system, which is, you know, a contrast to the board centric model where where existing sort of governance norms or best practices would be the first step to designing a governance system. OK, so that's the why. What about the what? Once we know why we do governance, we can really you know, quickly specify what it is. And governance is not policies and procedures, emotions and bylaws. That's some of how we do governance. Um, but governance is really, it's about decision making and specifically decision making that relates to advancing your core purpose. And then when we look at governance in that sense as decision making that advances core purpose, it's easy to see that governance isn't only happening um, with the board. Uh, yes, the board is making decisions um, that relate to your core purpose, but so are your staff and maybe other actors in your organization as well. And when we're thinking about um, other governance actors outside of your board, you know, it, we start to see that board meetings are not the single or even the central place where governance is happening. And that many things that we might not think of as governance in that conventional board-centric model are in fact part of your governance system. So the field of what we usually think about when we think about governance, board meetings, policies, um, annual member meetings, it's actually much broader than we realize. Two important things uh, here that I wanna draw your attention to. The first is that so much of the governance that goes on in your organization at the board and beyond it is, is usually invisible or informal. It's not codified, it's not written down, it's often not even acknowledged as governance per se. So when your uh, organization is having you know, a problem with governance, you're having a, a, you know, there's, there's a pain point in your governance system, but we only look at the board's formal practices to solve it, we're missing a big chunk of what's really going on. And the solution may not be very successful. So for example, we often think, you know, my board just needs a new training or a new policy and that's gonna solve whatever problem we're dealing with. But in fact, the issue may lie far beyond the scope of, of your board's policy or training. The second thing, and this is, I think, exciting, but also sometimes overwhelming for folks. You know, when we look at um, the full picture of governance in this way, there are very few fixed requirements for how you have to do governance. And there's a whole lot of discretion. You have so much room to design your organization's governance system in any way that you want. 
And most of what we think of as governance must haves are not must haves. And often they're not even nice to haves because they may not be functional for your organization. So the good news is that we can let go of some of those conventional governance norms that may not be serving uh, your board or your organization. And the bad news, or maybe the better news, is that you have to actually start to think about what will serve your organization. What kind of governance do we actually need to advance our core purpose? What will work for us? This brings me to, I guess, the last implication I want to share about the shift to uh, purpose-led governance. And that's that it makes it much easier to assess your governance. So in the board-centric model, we have to assess against checklists of policies, external benchmarks or, or measures, or subjective experiences or opinions of any whatever group of board members you have at that time. It's that circular approach, and it's not very intuitive. Um, you, you have to have a certain level of expertise in governance to, to decide whether or not you're, you're, you're dealing with, you know, quote unquote, good governance. And these external benchmarks may not actually fit your organization's needs or culture. But in the purpose-led model, if we know the point of governance is to advance core purpose, then we have a much more accessible and intuitive benchmark for assessing your governance. Because either your governance will enable the organization to advance core purpose, or it will constrain that ability. And everyone here, I know, I know that everyone here has experienced some of those governance constraints, right? When your governance becomes a hurdle to jump over on the way to doing your work. Okay. And if you want to share some examples, you can put some in the Q&A box right now. I'll say that there are, you know, two examples of constraints that I hear most often. One is a board that is micromanaging, um, or what people will say is, my board is too operational. Um, and the other is a board that's sort of abdicating its strategic responsibility. And we saw that in that first, um, in that first poll, where, where a big chunk of folks in this session are concerned that, you know, I'm not getting the strategic leadership I need in my organization. And I actually think those two things are often related. They're two sides of the same coin. So the reality is that, you know, every organization at any given time is going to have aspects of governance that enable and aspects that constrain. Um, but you can identify the constraints and then you can address them. And when I do governance assessments, I do it from this functional perspective. What is the constraint? How can we redesign your governance to address or remove it? And what I like about this approach is that it also acknowledges that your governance um, will change over time. You know, governance is dynamic because the environment you work in and even your own organization is dynamic. So if the way you need to advance core purpose changes, then your governance will need to change too. Well, yesterday's sort of like best practice is today's constraint or tomorrow's constraint <laughs> if you're lucky. And you know, we, we often have this idea that governance sort of develops in this linear way um, along you know, what we call organizational maturity, how, however old your organization is, how, that's how advanced your governance should be. But it's just not true. Governance is, is a dynamic system that has to evolve alongside your organization, um, but it's not a linear process. So, the big takeaway here is that um, governance is it's much, much bigger than your board. The conventional approach to nonprofit governance, that board-centric model, it's trained us to use the words board and governance interchangeably, but they are different. The reality is that your board is an administrative requirement prescribed by legislation and governance is decision-making that advances core purpose. Okay, so that's the difference. It's not, you know, in a perfect world, we could just separate the two, but that, that isn't how it works. Boards have an important role to play in governance, um, but not everything that the board does is governance. The board does lots of things that aren't considered, you know, governance in the definition that we're using. And not all governance happens at the board, but there is overlap. And the degree of overlap between 
boards and governance will look different in different organizations and can shift over time. Um, and some organizations will have a complete overlap. And those are probably organizations that just have a board and, and not much other uh, internal infrastructure. But there, there usually isn't a perfect fit between the board and governance. Um, nevertheless, the, the reality is that we have boards. Sometimes I think boards are the governance we have, but not necessarily the governance we want or need. And if this idea is intriguing to you, the folks behind the Reimagining Governance Lab have put together some great resources around this concept if you wanna check it out. The link will be on the slides when you get them following the webinar um, and it will also be on the webinar landing page. Um, so you can, you can find it there. So even though governance is bigger than the board, um, there is overlap. And we do have to acknowledge the reality of the board structure and what it means for our organizations and also for the people who volunteer to serve on boards. Because we don't talk about this as much as we should, but board members take on a lot of formal responsibility. And because they take on all of that responsibility in their role, they are ultimately accountable for all of the governance in the organization. And because of that, because board volunteers step up, step up to take on that accountability, it's only fair that they have authority or oversight over all of an organization's governance. You can't ask people to be accountable for something that they have no control over, okay? But the board doesn't have to do it all. They don't have to be the bottleneck. They, they are not the center, the board is not the sun. So a board has to have authority over everything it's accountable for but it can exercise that authority in a way that is enabling rather than constraining for the organization. Okay, so I wanna pause and check in here. Um, again, just to keep this conversation grounded in your experience and what is going on in your organizations. And I want to know which areas of responsibility does your board hold? So take a moment and select all the areas that apply to your board. And if you choose um, the last option, something else, you can write um, what it is in the Q&A box. So the options are human resources, monitoring and evaluation, fundraising and development, advocacy, networking, or something else. And we'll just give folks a minute to get their results in and we can see what it looks like. Right now, everybody's deliberating. Is this something my board does or something that I want my board to do? <laughs> okay, here are the results. So which areas of responsibility does your board hold? Um, 73% chose monitoring and evaluation. Um, let's see, what's the next? Fundraising and development, networking, advocacy, human resources. So a lot, there's a lot of spread here in terms of the data. I'm actually surprised by how many people chose advocacy um, because it's not a function that many nonprofit organizations are doing. So it's kind of um, great to see that. And we had a few people pick something else so you can see what um, what those other responsibilities look like in the Q&A box. So we see this list, none of those are really core board responsibilities, but, but your boards are doing them. And the reality is that today we are asking boards to do all sorts of things that may not be board responsibilities or may not be governance in the sense of what we're discussing today. And that's not necessarily bad, that's not wrong, right? Because you can design your governance system however you want. Um, but in many cases, what happens is this approach, this sort of scope creep around the board role um, that puts boards at the center of the governance system, it creates the very constraints that we want to solve. Those first things, um, those things that we mentioned in that first poll. Uh, what was it, challenges with the rec recruitment and retention, engagement, strategic leadership. 
Many of these can be solved by clarifying and simplifying the board's role in governance. And a purpose-led approach to governance allows boards to do less and in the process actually do a better job of fulfilling the board role. So what does that actually look like? It looks like what I call the minimum viable board. And the minimum viable board is a stripped down model that allows boards to focus only on core governance functions, which are the essential tasks that a board must do to fulfill its role effectively without any of that scope creep. Just the basics, but the basics are enough because the board doesn't have to do it all. The board is not the sun. And truthfully, in many cases, boards are actually not fulfilling all of the core governance functions. So what we're doing is we're putting additional responsibilities on boards, like fundraising, like HR, when they haven't mastered the foundational pieces of what they need to do. And I mean, it's not really fair, right? It's not fair to your board members who are volunteers who've stepped up to take on that significant level of accountability and are now not fulfilling their responsibility because they have all these other things to do. And it's not fair to your organization because it introduces constraints on your ability to advance core purpose. So this is the piece that I think really isn't working when it comes to nonprofit boards. Okay, so I have a toolkit that you can access. It's a free resource that I share with organizations. It outlines each of the core governance functions for a minimum viable board. And it includes basically everything a board needs to fulfill those functions effectively. It tells you when to do them, how often, what the process should look like, and even what questions the board members should be asking for each function. So if you want a board that manages all of their core governance responsibilities predictably, effectively, confidently, this is a toolkit that will get you there. The link will be here in the slides uh, when you receive them after the webinar, and they'll also be, uh, the link will also be available on the landing page uh, when, it, when it goes out tomorrow. So what is great about this approach is that it makes sure your board is doing everything a board needs to do and nothing else. And this sets your board up to be stronger and more sustainable. It's counterintuitive because we've been in that board centric model for so long where we think, you know, for my board to be effective, they need to do more and more and more and more and more. But in the purpose led model for governance, we can say, no, actually your board can be more effective by doing less and doing doing just those core pieces and doing them well. So this tool will provide a clear long-term overview of what those board requirements are. So your board can be proactive and, and feel organized and on top of things. It also lets EDs know exactly what their board is going to need and when they're going to need it. So it really streamlines that um, for those folks who are saying, you know, capacity to support my board is an issue. This can be a, um, a help for that as well. Um, when you go into the document, it provides that step-by-step -step approach that empowers board members to fulfill their role confidently. When I, when I do work with boards, uh, I interview board directors, and it, it's amazing to me how often people say, I just don't know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do or how to do it well, and I really just want to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. This is a tool for those people. It's going to tell you exactly what to do and how to do it well. And so you can feel confident in your role. And, and that shortens the learning curve for directors who might be newer to governance. It also sort of demystifies and simplifies the board approach. And what happens is that um, the board can actually focus more on bigger picture stuff if you want them to, if, if that's what works for your governance system. And there are some people who will look at this and say, yes, this is exactly what I need. My board can just focus on these. I think there's maybe 26 things, whatever it might be, um, and, and that's fine. And then there are other people who are saying, no, no, no. I need my board to pull more weight than that. So if a minimum viable board isn't for you, if it's not a fit with the kind of governance system you need in your organization, or you have board members who are really keen, then I recommend adopting what I call a building board. And the building board is a minimum viable board. 
but with an extra layer of engagement. And that engagement involves two things. It involves thinking and learning and creating enabling infrastructure. So if your board wants to be hands-on, they want to build capacity, they want to go beyond the basics, you know, or if you're, if you're one of those uh, folks who responded to that first poll saying, engagement is an issue with my board, then what should be happening is your board should ask themselves um, two things every year when they make their annual work plan. And yeah, your board should be making an annual work plan. It's not on the core governance uh, functions list, but it is an important piece of uh, procedure for boards. So when your board is doing its annual planning, they're going to ask themselves, what thinking and learning do we need to do to equip us to advance our core purpose? And what enabling infrastructure can we develop that will support our organization to advance core purpose? You'll note that both of these are about advancing core purpose because governance should always be pointing toward core purpose, okay? Board development is not there for the sake of developing your board. It's there for the sake of advancing your organization's core purpose. So for, for, for organizations where Board engagement is, is one of those pain points and, and it's so common and we saw that already, um, how common that is for folks. What happens too often is that we engage down. We look at our board, we say we need our board to be more engaged and we pull them into the operations of the organization. And by operations, I mean areas that are covered by staff job descriptions. But a better approach, there's all sorts of reasons why that, that engaging down becomes problematic and we won't get into that too much right now. But a better approach is to engage upward, right? So as a building board, you can open up space for meaningful hands-on contributions for board members. I will say um, that these two additional engagement functions, thinking and learning and um, building enabling infrastructure, these are, these are governance functions that should be happening in every organization. They don't necessarily need to happen at the board. They're not core governance functions, um, but they do need to be happening as part of your governance system. But if you are wanting to build a more engaging board, then you can put these functions in with your board. And, and this, is, this is, I think, the solution to the board engagement question. So we're gonna start kind of summarizing stuff here. When, when you start to look at your organization's governance from that purpose-led approach, then you get to decide exactly what kind of governance system you need. And so if you're thinking about, well, how do I, how do I design my governance system or redesign my governance system um, around core purpose? There are two sort of things you need to think about. The first is, what decisions need to be made in your organization to advance core purpose and what functions will support the best decision making? And then what is the best way to fulfill those functions and who is best suited to do that work? If you really, if you honestly answer those questions, you'll find that the answer is rarely my board, right? There, there are probably other ways to, to fulfill those governance functions outside of your board. And the other thing you might find is that your organization may need less governance than you think. So because we've bought into that sort of like linear development um, idea around governance that, you know, a, a mature organization's governance gets bigger and better every, every, every year over time, we, we've bought into this idea that bigger is better. The more, the more, the bigger your policy manual, the better your governance. The bigger your board, the better your governance. That is just absolutely not true. Um, governance design, you know, it's a matter of fit and of function. Bigger is not necessarily better. And when you design governance for purpose, you will end up with a more functional governance system overall and a more effective and sustainable board. So this diagram here up on the slide it shows you um, some of the different components you can design into your governance system outside of the board. And I mean, this is, this is by no means whatsoever an exhaustive list. There are so many possibilities. 
governance design is one of the favorite um, favorite things that I do in my role. There's so much potential. So I'll just pick out a couple of examples here. So thinking about something we see when we put fundraising onto boards, it's very common to invite people onto your board, not because they can help you advance your core purpose, but because they can help you access wealth. They have access to networks, either they have access to wealth personally, or they have access to networks uh, of wealthy individuals. And that leads to some really significant governance constraints. Uh, it can lead to a lot of messy issues um, in your board and in your organization. But if, if you move that fundraising function away from your board, then you can have, for example, an ambassador circle where you can invite people who have access to wealth or who maybe um, have, have insight or expertise in fund development. Um, and that's their only purpose. Their purpose is to generate revenue to fund your core purpose. It becomes much cleaner and much more engaging and much more focused. Um, another place where I think we put way too much emphasis on boards is strategic planning. And, you know, I do a lot of strategic planning. Um, and often what people will say to me at the outset is, you know, I really want my board to own this strategic plan. My board needs to be really involved. Um, when in reality, your board may not be well positioned to lead a strategic plan. Your board should make sure that the organization has a solid strategy, but they don't have to lead the strategic plan. They don't even necessarily have to be involved in the strategic plan. The people who make your strategic plan should be people who understand um, your core purpose, the environment you're working in, the capacity uh, and structures of your organization, the strategic options available to you and how to decide which ones to apply. Strategic planning is much more operational, uh, requires much more operational knowledge than we think. And boards often just don't have the context or depth of knowledge or expertise to lead in that area. So again, you can pull strategic planning away from your board. It's still part of your governance system. It's there to advance your core purpose. Your board can be as involved as is functional um, and no more. Uh, okay, I'll leave that. I'll leave the other examples there, but um, hopefully you get an idea of how you can pull things away from your board, still meet those, um, make sure that you're meeting the governance functions that your organization needs and in a way that is uh, much more functional in terms of advancing your, your organization's core purpose. Okay, so key takeaways. Putting purpose at the heart of your governance is really, really, really important. And even if, you know, at this point you're thinking, no, 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 I don't, I'm not interested in redesigning my governance system. My board is doing all this stuff. My board is great. I, I, nobody wants to change any of that. That's fine. If your board structure is, is working for you, that is wonderful. That is awesome. That if it's functional, it's functional. You don't need to change it. If it's not broken, don't fix it, right? But put core purpose at the heart of what your board does. Everything will start to make more sense to those people around the table who are sitting there trying to figure out how do I self-organize, right? How do I know if I'm doing a good job? How do I know if we're on the right track? If you let people anchor themselves around core purpose, all of that work becomes much more intuitive. That's when your board can start to really take self-directed leadership. Um, the next key takeaway is around that minimum viable board. Okay, the board matters. They do not have to do it all. They do have to do all of those core functions. So start there. Okay, start there and then make decisions. At once your board has covered off all of those core functions, um, think about what else makes sense for our board to take on. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's nothing. Maybe we just focus on these things. Those core functions will be enough. And they will keep your board, like, they'll keep your board busy. And the last thing is just, you know, as a governance consultant, I often ask people or people often ask me, what is the best practice? They'll say, this is the challenge we're experiencing. What is the best practice? And there is no universal best practice. Okay. So, so we have to let go of this idea and we have to, we have to stop trying to fit into that governance box. Okay. You can design your governance system to fit the unique function of your, of, of your organization. 
um, and you don't have to you don't have to um, try and try and contort uh, you know into those conventional practices that may or may not be a good fit for you. Okay, so this has been a bit of a rapid fire session. Um, if you have, uh, I know we're gonna do some Q and A here, um, but if you have follow up questions or you wanna have a conversation after this, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can connect with me there, uh, send me a message. You can reach out to me by email and you can also book um, a Zoom call. I keep space in my calendar open um, every week for networking calls. And I'm always happy to, as I mentioned earlier, chat about nonprofit governance. It's my favorite thing to talk about. So feel free to reach out. And Thanks. I'll, yeah, I'll throw it over to you, Charlie. Thanks very much, Nick. That was a great presentation. We'll now get into the Q&A se session. Um, first question I have is, can you please provide some examples of when governance can enable or constrain? Okay. I didn't get to see what folks put in the Q&A um, when I popped that up, but uh, let me think of an example. So um, I chatted a little bit about that micromanaging piece. Okay, so when your board, um, when, you're, when your board is trying to do their job and it's not clear what their job is, they will start to look for different different places to do it. And one of the things that will happen is your board will start to look down into the organization. And they'll start looking at areas that are covered by staff job descriptions. And they'll say, you know what? Um, this staff person who is our one person marketing department, they're great and all, but I actually have been doing marketing work my entire life. So I'm gonna get involved. Um, and, and I'm gonna start having some like hands-on conversations and getting involved. Maybe we're going to make a committee, whatever. We're going to get, we're getting in there. Um, and, and sometimes that can work. Most, most often it does not. And what happens is that your marketing person who, um, who is doing their job can no longer just do their job. They know what they need to do to advance the goals of the organization to help advance core purpose, but they can't just do it because now they have to loop back um, to 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 connect with board member and to um, you know to manage that relationship in a weird power dynamic every time they want to do something in their own job that is a constraint because now your staff person has to jump over a hurdle every time they want to do their job it makes it harder for them to advance core purpose so that would be a constraint um, yeah. Uh, we'll move on to, or right, here, I'll let you finish. Okay. I'll just give a quick example of um, what an enabling um, part, what, an example of an enabling piece of infrastructure would be a really clearly thought out strategic plan. So you, your board has approved a strategic plan. It gives really clear goals and timelines for your organization. And now the organization staff can run with it. They can implement it in the way that makes the most sense on the ground that is enabling governance. Great. Uh, the next question I have is, if there isn't a definitive line between governance and operations, how do you manage the relationship between board and staff to prevent micromanaging? Yeah. This is a question I get often. When we talk about governance happening beyond the board, and then we start to people start to worry about that micromanaging piece that we just talked about as a constraint. And um, there isn't a, a magic line between governance and operations. That's that's sort of like this myth that we've created in, in the sector. Um, it, certainly in terms of separating board and staff, right? Because your board is doing governance, your staff are doing governance, your staff are doing operations. There's operational stuff that your board does as well, right? And, and there's a lot of gray area in between. So what I recommend is to use um, staff job descriptions to draw that line because job descriptions are a policy tool inside your organization that define roles. So once a staff person is hired into um, a, a, a role, they are the most effective person to do what they need to do, okay? And, and so if, if the board has created a job description and then the organization is hired into it, there's no reason for the board to get involved unless something is very, very wrong. 
So any board involvement in an area covered by staff job descriptions for me is a red flag. It's a, that's a governance constraint as we, we just talked about that piece, but um, job descriptions are the line for me. Great. Uh, the next question I have is how do working boards who don't have staff to run the organization stay on track with core purpose? What are some of the challenges these boards may face? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it's important to start. So an unstaffed organization, often you have a board and committees, um, but you don't, you don't need to have the board doing everything in the organization, even when you don't have staff. So your board needs to start with those minimum viable board guidelines and then decide what do we need to do to advance core purpose? All right. And what, what is the best way for us to do it? Is it a volunteer committee? You know, is it, um, is it us as board members taking on and doing more work? What does that look like? You're, you're, I, whenever it's possible to separate those roles, I think it's really helpful. The board does what the board needs to do and all the other governance roles should be defined as separate. Um, doesn't mean the board can't do them, but they need to know that that isn't their board role. Now they're doing their HR role or now they're doing their communications role, or now they're doing their program role. Um, so, so clarify governance roles and don't assume that every governance role lives in the board. And if you do it that way, then if your organization ends up becoming staffed in the future, it'll be much easier to kind of peel apart board and staff. That's always a big tension in, in organizations that have recently hired staff, kind of moving from that like so-called working board to a policy board. Um, what that looks like. Just understand that governance functions and roles can be separate from the board from the get-go, even if the same people are fulfilling multiple roles. Awesome. All right. The next question I have is, can you have committee members on your board committees who are not directors? If so, can you have your fundraising committee essentially become an ambassador circle with the members you ask to join it? Yeah, so there's two questions there. Um, the answer to the first question is nuanced. Yes, you can, if, if your bylaws permit, you can have non-board members on board committees. <clears throat> um, unless, unless you're delegating board work to those committees and those committees will be making, um, taking votes, making decisions on behalf of the board, in which case, uh, your committee should only have board members. That's a procedural nuance that isn't that important to this answer. Um, many boards have fundraising committees. And what I will say is that fundraising is not a board function. So if your organization has a fundraising committee, it does not need to be a board committee. Why would your fundraising committee report to the board? If you have staff, fundraising would, would probably fall under um, purview of staff job description. So if you have a fundraising committee, that should be a staff led committee. Um, and and it shouldn't be reporting to the board. It doesn't, functionally, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you have a fundraising committee and you wanna transition it to an ambassador committee or an ambassador circle, I think that's brilliant. I think it's a great way to manage that. It does not need to be attached to your board in any way whatsoever. Great, all right. So the next question I have, is also a little bit of a two question, but short ones. Can you please define core purpose once again? Is it the same as the mission statement? Uh, okay, good question. I I really dislike the use of um, mission and vision. I find it confusing, and I find it um, I find the I find that those are really vague tools. This is something that happened in the '90s, where um, it just became the norm to create a mission and a vision. And so organizations think they have to have a mission and vision. No, you do not. That is just that is just a convention. <laughs> it is not a requirement. Um, so just some essentially the answer is yes, technically mission and vision are the same as core purpose, but I would say core purpose to be clear and to not entangle it and all of all of the business I have with mission and vision, I would say core purpose is why does your organization exist? What is it here to do? 
we need to be able to say that in a statement, like one sentence, this is why we exist. And then you can, you know, when I work with organizations around clarifying core purpose, we usually go one step deeper um, to say, okay, within, within the broad statement of our core purpose, what are our impact priorities right now? And I, I just find mission and vision, it, it, it's so open to interpretation. You'll have 10 people sitting around a board table um, thinking very different things when they look at the mission and vision, but core purpose should be very, very clear and explicit so that you are much closer to a shared understanding of why your organization exists. I also, I don't wanna confuse it with charitable purposes under CRA if you're a charity. Those again are administrative categories. Um, it's it's the reason that your organization exists, the change that you are trying to make. Awesome. We'll get into a couple more. Um, what suggestions do you have for governance models for very small organizations that only have one full-time staff member, the director, and a few part-time employees? Yeah, I mean, that's most organizations, right? Um, that is the majority of, of nonprofits and charities in Canada. So, um, I will say to my earlier point, bigger isn't always better. We have this we have this idea that in a small organization you need a big board because it builds capacity. I have almost never seen that uh, play out it, it, in that way. A bigger board does not necessarily build capacity. It tends to drain capacity from your staff. So if you have um, a small a small organization, a small staff, there's no reason not to have a smaller board. You need three people, right? Three people on your board. Six is a nice number. You can have conversations, builds a bit of, um, makes it a bit easier for um, succession and stability. Um, and then beyond those board basics, just really ask yourself, what, what governance does our organization need, right? If you're a small organization and, um, you know, you're a community-based organization and you need to have connections to community, then think about, what is the best way for us to forge those connections with the community? It's probably not recruiting an extra five people to our board. That's a terrible way to build relationships with community, right? No, we probably need to, to create some kind of mechanism, um, whether it's whether it's an advisory committee that, that feeds into our organization as a whole, whether it's um, a networking strategy for our staff, whatever that looks like. You just have to be really specific about what do we actually need? beyond the board basics, what do we actually need and, and who is the best to do it? Wonderful, all right. Another question we have here, how do you set up your executive committee? Who should be on it? Who chairs it? Is it the executive director or maybe an ex officio member? Um, so executive committee, you'll have to look at your bylaws. Um, your bylaws will say whether or not you have an executive committee and, and what its makeup is. Um, you don't have to have an executive committee. Um, I, I tend to think that there's less reason now to have an executive committee. I think executive committees for the board existed in a time when if your board had to make um, an important decision quickly, it was easier to get four people together than 10 or 12. Um, but in the age of online meetings, I, I, I don't see a, a big benefit to having an executive committee, to be honest. Awesome. Uh, next question we have is, have you ever had experience with the consent-based decision-making model of governance? Like, I, I'm guessing we're talking about consensus-based decision-making. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, we need to think about, again, the difference between board and other governance. So, I have seen uh, and helped build shared leadership structures within um, organizations where you have executive leadership shared across multiple staff roles. So that becomes uh, an area where you can have usually a mix of consensus-based and, um, um, and individually driven decision-making. Um, at the board, boards do have to vote. So whatever process you use before you get to a vote is up to you. If you want it to be consensus-based, um, you can certainly build in the right kind of processes to support that, but ultimately your board has to vote and each board member needs to have the ability to vote independently um, and to register uh, opposition to a vote. So it's not always the best approach 
for board business. Um, but if you have other governance bodies in your organization where that's a fit, um, particularly if it's if it's about your organizational culture or values, um, then I think it's I think it's a valid and doable model. But you do need the thoughtful process around it, um, in, in part just because people don't know how to do it very well. Awesome. All right, we'll move on to the last question of the day. This is a bit of a follow up question. It refers back to your example where you're discussing the board member who might be potentially micromanaging the marketing staff member, let's say. <laughs> so what happens if the staff person isn't fully performing their job description? Whose responsibility is it to address that? And should the board be made aware of this? Yeah. Um, that example might have been more specific than was helpful, but I will say that usually, like if you have someone who's in charge of marketing in your organization, then you probably have an executive director or manager. And I bet that their job description is to manage other staff and therefore it would be their role. Um, at any point, because as I mentioned, a board does need to have authority over anything they're accountable for. Um, and they would be accountable for, for, for things that staff do. The board does have the ability, if something is going you know, really wrong to step in and get involved in whatever way makes the most sense for them. Um, but I think that should be used incredibly sparingly. And I think it should be a last resort for boards. So ideally what you want as a, from a board perspective is to build up that enabling infrastructure. So do you have good job descriptions, clear job descriptions? Do you have a performance management system in place? Um, is that performance management system being used? Like those are the those are the levers that a board would want to focus on rather than getting directly involved in, is this individual doing their job effectively? That so quickly devolves into, I don't like the font on your poster, right? Which is, which is not helpful for anyone. Thank you very much uh, for presenting such an informative webinar and answering all those questions wonderfully. Uh, do you happen to have any final thoughts before or final comments before we sign off today? Um, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just say, you know, you, you don't have to settle for crappy governance, right? So if, if things aren't working for you, if that sort of conventional board model um, isn't working for your organization, then you, you have the agency to design a more functional governance system that enables you to advance your core purpose. Um, and, and you shouldn't be afraid to do it. I think now is the time. Um, the, the, the landscape of nonprofit leadership is shifting. Um, we're requiring so much of boards at a time when people don't have as much to give from a volunteer perspective. And so I think now is the perfect time to start to make those shifts in the name of building a more sustainable and effective governance system for the organization. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that you will receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the webinar recording. Please feel free to share this link with your colleagues. The, the email will also include a survey link that you can fill out with your feedback on today's webinar. You should see a survey link pop right up here in Zoom following the session as well. Uh, on behalf of Charity Village, thank you so much for joining us today. Please keep an eye on our webinar page for all of our upcoming events. You can find more information on all of our upcoming webinars at charityvillage.com slash webinars. Alternatively, feel free to sign up for our newsletter to make sure you don't miss the next webinar hosted by Charity Village. Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.